All right, so it's nine o'clock. We'll get started. Good morning. Welcome to the end of week. We believe it's almost half. What? No way. So, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first, Liz is joining our class. Uh, she's doing a director's observation, and she does that annually for all of us. So, welcome. And then another important announcement. I heard it's somebody's birthday today. Oh. <laughs> birthday. We sing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Only if you lead. All right. So, lecture is going to be a little bit different today. We uh, have another half hour because it was sort of my. I thought the test was already automatically half hour off. So we'll be here from 9 to 9.50. And it's going to be broken up into three parts. The first is a very quick uh, quiz review. I only added maybe five questions, probably the most missed ones. Now we're going to do a really quick uh, recorded lecture review. So some topics and some brief overview of that. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. And then I have a series of NCLEX questions that pertain to um, the lecture and the reading. All right, so we'll start with the quiz review real quick here. That button. All right, so the first one is, how should the nurse modify the client's care plan to address the risk of insufficient oxygenation in a patient with altered perfusion? Uh, the choices were encourage ambulation of 30 minutes. Probably not all that realistic. Um, instructing on deep breathing. We'll hold off on that one. Administering medications appropriate to increase heart rate. Don't really want to do that. Um, positioning to increase blood return. And the correct answer is instructing on deep breathing. Because if you are going to take some deep breaths in, you're going to get more oxygen and then expel that CO2. So that'll help with perfusion overall. The next one is which physical findings when assessing the client being treated for congestive heart failure would indicate that the client's condition is deteriorating. Select all that apply. And there are two correct answers here. And we'll go with, uh, we'll start with the incorrect ones. Uh, pulse oximeter reading of 96%. That's a perfect score for them. Perfect oxygen saturation. And one that some people marked was a moderate amount of clear, thin mucus. And the key word on this one is the clear, thin, because they can expectorate that. If it was thick, probably not so much. So the correct answers would be urine output 60 milliliters over eight hours. And I don't know if you found the reading with AP or any other class, but the normal is generally we want to see 30 milliliters of urine an hour, and this would put us about 20. So we kind of want to watch for that. And wheezing of breath sounds in all lobes. Next is, how would the nurse classify the blood pressure of a 13-year-old female with a BMI of 30.4 recorded as 121 over 83? So it's a 13-year-old female considered obese with her BMI, um, and her blood pressure is over 120 over 80. So the correct answer is primary hypertension, and that's because um, the high blood pressure, we're not quite sure where that's coming from. Um, and it's also known as idiopathic or essential. And above normal blood pressure is typically 120 over 80. Hypotension is low blood pressure. Normal blood pressure is under the 120 over 80. And secondary hypertension is well above this. I think we have one or two more. 
uh, which factor is least likely to have an impact on blood pressure? Um, and that would be the heart rate. The heart rate has some impact on blood pressure, it depends on how fast, but not as much as pumping action of the heart. So if the pumping or the contraction is a little bit low or quite a bit low, that's going to affect the blood pressure, bringing it too low. Or if they're on some stimulant contracting quite a bit, that's going to raise blood pressure. Peripheral vascular disease or resistance. That's where all of the uh, the blood vessels are kind of clamped down, raising blood pressure. And blood volume. So too much blood volume, higher blood pressure, um, bleeding or dehydration, <clears throat> um, low blood volume can cause low blood pressure. One more. When educating the client recovering from an acute MI about the prescription of aspirin, which teaching points should the nurse include? Select all that apply. So let's talk about the first one. Uh, report any itching after several days or se seven days of taking it. Usually, if you're going to have some kind of allergic reaction to a medication, it's going to happen relatively quickly, usually within the first 10 minutes or so. Um, Take it at a different time of day other than warfarin. I mean, you could, but you could still take both of them at the same time. Uh, do not skip any scheduled appointments to have blood drawn for labs. There's no specific blood or uh, lab value for that, except for that test how much aspirin you have in your system. So the correct answers would be check with your healthcare provider before taking any herbal supplements or remedies. And it's a mild blood thinner. So before bleeding and bruising to a healthcare provider. And that's it for that one. Let me change this out. Thank you. I have to know what was the answer to the question about the patient hospitalized for complications of asthma and bringing in gas? Yes, I wanted to know that one too. Uh, so what do we think that is? A book. book. Yes. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. You got it. Yeah, because a book. Kind of question. Yeah, a book really doesn't. The teddy bear. It was that or the teddy bear. Yeah. And I think the teddy bear could probably harbor some dust or bacteria, but a book's pretty benign. Good question. Let's do this one. Don't bother. And I wanted my lecture slides to match my clothing, so here we go. All righty. So let's start with this. So. Our uh, week involved comfort. So comfort is a fundamental outcome of nursing care. We want our patients to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. While discomfort can arise from various sources affecting different aspects of human experience, um, almost sounded like I was uh, Key alterations in comfort include pain, fatigue, and sleep disorders each with physical, emotional, psycho, spiritual, social, cultural, and environmental dimensions. Genetics, genetics play a significant role in susceptibility to, to discomfort related diseases, influencing pain, perception, sleep patterns, and mental health. All right, so I only added a few lines for each category, so we'll kind of go over those briefly before we get to the NCLEX question. Be available to us at home. Yeah, I'm going to post that after. Class. Thank you. All right. So, differentiate, differentiate alterations in comfort. So, comfort can be altered physically, emotionally, or both. And remember, everything that we do as a nurse is going to be holistic. And we'll kind of get to that later. So, physical, emotional, spiritual, pretty much what we went over on the last slide. Uh, physical alterations include pain, temperature changes, or positioning discomfort. And I was going to make the room super cold, 
to have you guys experience um, discomfort, but I wasn't quite sure if I was able to make that change. So that would have been a cool um, class activity. So maybe next time. <laughs> Emotional alterations may include stress, anxiety, or any kind of psychological factors. Relationship between comfort and other concepts. Um, closely related to quality of life. So the more comfortable you are, the better the patient's quality of life is going to be. Um, intersects with pain and alleviating pain and enhances comfort. Emotional well-being coping mechanisms. Let's move that up. And, of course, social support can influence comfort. Uh, promoting comfort, so any disease process or item we're going to promote to prevent or change alterations in comfort. Uh, promoting comfort involves addressing the physical and emotional needs, uh, individualized, individualized care plans, everybody's different, effective communication, um, creating a supportive environment to contribute to comfort promotion. Assessment procedures and tests for comfort. Um, we can do pain scales, um, patient self reports. And remember, um, pain is a subjective assessment finding. So, whatever the patient says the pain is, that's what it is. Um, observation, observational tools for physical discomfort. If they're non verbal, we want to go by their facial expressions and uh, moving around. Um, psychological assessments for emotional comfort. Independent interventions, and that means what the nurse can do without the provider um, or without having to obtain an order. Um, we can administer pain meds, you know, that's with an order, but um, the provider doesn't have to directly do that. Uh, providing comfort measures and offering emotional support. That's kind of big for nurses. We want to provide that emotional support, being in the hospital or having some kind of chronic illness is pretty hard on people. Uh, collaborative therapies. Uh, we can collaborate with physical therapists, psychologists, and pharmacists. Um, getting everybody together to discuss a uh, patient's comfort is important. Examples are like an interdisciplinary pain management program or and holistic care approaches. And this one's kind of brief consideration across lifespan. Um, it involves infants, children, young adults, older adults. I'll let you read. <laughs> so let's talk about acute and chronic pain briefly. Um, Acute pain is from tissue damage. Chronic is from persistent conditions. Risk factors um, and prevention of acute and chronic pain. Um, we want to take care of the underlying issues for acute pain. Uh, for chronic pain prevention, um, we want to manage contributing factors like inflammation or lifestyle. So some of the things that our patients or us do um, can determine how comfortable or how our uh, quality of life is going to be. Clinical manifest clinical yeah, if I can talk clinical manifestations of acute and chronic pain. Um, acute pain is sudden and sharp generally. Chronic pain may be persistent with associated symptoms like talk about fatigue as well, or you've learned about this fatigue, or you're going to be studying about that this weekend. Diagnostic tests and therapies. Um, they include imaging, nerve conduction studies. Uh, therapies range from medications to physical therapy or psychological interventions. Um, and then like with every disease process, we're going to talk about the lifespan from infants to older adults. Uh, consider developmental stages and communication abilities. Are they verbal, nonverbal? 
a nursing process for culturally competent care, because in any community, we're going to have a kind of a conglomeration of different cultures, assess cultural beliefs about pain expression and management, and develop care plans respecting cultural preferences. So in some cultures, uh, they're pretty stoic with the pain. So like their five out of 10 would be somebody else's 10 out of 10. So we want to be able to, and then kind of vice versa, if somebody's five out of 10, um, somebody else, it could be somebody else's like one or two out of 10. Next one. And during my recorded lecture, we talked about the three-step analgesic ladders. So remember the three steps. Ding, ding, ding. And step one. We don't want to, do we want to start with opiates? No. Good answer. So yeah, non-opiate medications. So Tylenol, ibuprofen, Proxim, anything over the counter. Uh, weak opiates like codeine or strong opiates if it's kind of uncontrolled and not very managed with step one or two. Uh, morphine, fentanyl, some of the other ones for severe pain. And fatigue. Um, etiology includes a few things, emotion, or medical conditions, emotional stress. Sleep disturbances. Um, risk factors include chronic illness, which is what the class is, um, chronic illness. And prevention involves managing contributing factors. Clinical manifestations and diagnostic tests. Um, so some of the clinical manifestations are physical weakness, lack of energy, difficulty concentrating, and blood work. Something could be off. Uh, interprofessional collaboration. Um, therapies may include medication, lifestyle modifications, or psychological support. And considerations across the lifespan for fatigue, like everything else. Uh, tailored interventions based on age related factors and individual needs. So, basically, from infant to older adults. And uh, consider cultural beliefs and practices regarding rest work, and help. That's kind of a, a big one. Um, we're also going to talk about fibromyalgia, and there will be a few test questions on this uh, disease. Non-pharmacological interventions include exercise, cognitive behavior therapy, and stress management. Um, there are a few pharmacological options. Uh, get to know those. Involves um, abnormalities and pain processes, and it has uh, a number of different etiologies. Risk factors, prevention, and clinical manifestations. Um, risk factors include genetics, gender, and certain infections. Uh, what particular gender do you think fibromyalgia affects the most? Mm -hmm. Women, yeah. Diagnosis based on clinical criteria. Um, interprofessional teams include rheumatologists, physical therapists, and psychologists. Because remember, holistic approach um, physical, emotional, psycho spiritual. Considerations across lifespan. Um, modify interventions based on the event on multiple stages. And that seems to be the same answer for all of you. Now let's go to rest sleep disorders. And then we're almost to the NCLEX questions. Let's see. Okay, I think we're good. Interventions include sleep hygiene education, relaxation techniques, and promoting a conducive sleep environment. So we could teach the patients to turn, uh, turn the lights off, um, turn the music off, maybe have some white noise like a fan. Uh, types of insomnia include sleep apnea, narcolepsy, and restless leg syndrome. So get to know some of these pretty well. 
All right, and then we're to the NCLEX questions. So what do you think the answer is to this one? He's dead. So probably D, but A could be correct. B, that could be correct. And C could also be correct. Yeah. Deceased. Yeah. Wanted to throw that into the quiz, but I thought better of it. All right. So. Any questions before we start here? How about Curry? I don't think so. No. Okay. All right. So, what are basic alterations in comfort mentioned in the lecture? So, we've got A, B, C, or D. And we'll start with Curry, just so everybody gets a chance to answer. B. But did you say B? Yes, pain, fatigue, and uh, sleep rest disorders. Anything else? You all think B? <clears throat> yes, good job. So pain, fatigue, sleep disorders. That was on our first slide or second slide. In the context of discomfort, what does Psycho-spiritual discomfort involved, A, B, C, or D? We'll go with Kuz. Say B? Yeah. Yep. And Curry, what do you think? Would you agree, disagree? Agree. Yes, good job. Well, so far, so good. We're two out of two. And let me move this down a little bit. Okay. So what is a crucial aspect of sleep hygiene for managing discomfort associated with illness or injury? A, B, C, or D? And we'll start with uh, Curry. Anybody else? So we have a B and a C. You don't want to stop. So the answer is C. You want them to avoid stimulants and particular medications. I think we can probably relate to this one. <laughs> right. How do infants primarily communicate discomfort? Oh, that was quick. <laughs> that one can be on the test, yeah. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> I, I don't want to give away too much. Which term describes a type of pain that comes and goes over time with recurring episodes of pain separated by periods of relief or less severe discomfort? And and when you're looking at the question, focus on pain that comes and goes focus on recurring episodes pain, and focus on separated by periods of relief or less severe discomfort. B. Which one? B, chronic recurrent pain. Does anybody else agree with that? Okay, that's correct, good job. Yep. 
So get to know your types of pain well. And uh, some of them I have professional. And I know some of you really enjoy the select all that apply. Next, what are common characteristics of phantom pain? With uh, curry. B. Say B. Needles and or less lacerating pain. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Does everybody else agree with that? All right. B. Yes. Good job. Which pharmacological therapy is included in step three of the WHO three-step analgesic ladder? E? E. Somebody else say something else. So, e. Anybody else agree, disagree? E. That's correct. Good job. I guess remember step one, non opiate energy six. Step two, milder, and then step three, stronger. And so everybody experiences pain. Over here. What are potential psychosocial effects of chronic pain? as mentioned in the lecture. And we'll start with uh, Curry. And the key word in the question is psychosocial. C. Which one? Uh, depression and social withdrawal. Anybody else? Okay. That's correct. Good job. A little bit of rationale there. When is end of dose pain or breakthrough pain most likely to occur? We'll start with Kuz. B. Anybody else? Yep, after the medication wears off. And at that point, if that keeps happening, um, the nurse needs to talk to the provider about having some kind of adjunct medication, like maybe if it's bad enough, Ativan or some other type of pain medication, or adjusting the, the times for the doses. What is the primary characteristic of somatic pain? <laughs> C or D. Okay. Anybody else? B. So we have a few Bs, one A. So you're going with B again? Yeah. Okay. How about Curry? Do you agree? We're conflicted as well. Okay. So what would you say? Um, B. Something that you can point to, something, yeah. So sure. localize or well, yeah. pain. No, I don't have rational for that one. Okay, which type of pain may be less able to feel normal touch and associated is associated with conditions like stroke or multiple scler sclerosis that or MS I'll say MS A B C or D then think about in the question um, some of the key words like stroke or MS in the question 
which type of pain may be less able to feel normal touch? If you're like when you touch it, you yeah, when you touch people. people. Yeah. Okay. Somebody say a. Is the heart? I don't know. Is it a neural thing, or it's inside your body, so you can't touch it. Neural. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else agree with that? Yeah, central pain. It's a uh, central nervous system feel. And this will give a little rationale. This is going to lead to alter sensation in touch and other things. I think some of us can relate to this one. Which symptom is characteristic of chronic fatigue syndrome? Keywords are chronic. Okay. All right. Does it everybody agree? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. So most chronic diseases last longer than six months. Nurses assessing the patient from a culturally diverse background who reports persistent fatigue. What is the most culturally competent nursing action? Let me give you some. And I think a couple of these might be obvious to exclude. B. B? Okay. Anything else? Anybody, everybody agree? You're correct. B. So we want to acknowledge and respect the patient's cultural practices. I might have left, let's see. Okay, we have a decent amount of time. All right, I'll let you read that. Then we'll go to the next one. Okay. So the following is a neurologic symptom associated with fatigue. And the key words, neurologic symptom. Which one? Oh, great. Let's see. Okay. Everybody agree? Yeah, because palpitations, loss of appetite, and blurry vision are more on the physical side of things. What was the primary goal of patient teaching regarding fatigue prevention? Okay. All right. Everybody agree? Yes, maybe a balanced diet and exercise. Finally, physics is experiencing chronic fatigue due to a medication for seasonal seasonal allergies. Seeks nursing intervention. What action would be the most beneficial for the client? A, B, C, or D? Let me say C. All right, does everybody agree? Right. Yeah, because if they're taking like Benadryl during the day, they're going to be kind of groggy and fatigued. So we might want to see about getting that changed. You know, we have more than 10 questions, but 
relatively far. It's not that much. <laughs> All right. What characterizes the primary clinical symptoms associated with fibromyalgia? A, B, C, or D? C. C? Okay. Does everybody agree? Yes. Right. But population is not at high risk for fibromyalgia. <laughs> Job. Everybody agree that's A? Maybe the questions are going to be this, but kind of gives you an idea of what keywords. Yeah, so not um, would be A. Do we have any other questions? <laughs> no. If you want some, I could add a couple. It's still early. This won't be for me. What is the key preventative measure for sleep rest disorders? Does everybody agree that it's A? Factor is not a common risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea. And this one might be slightly obvious, but um, there's one correct answer. Maybe. Anybody else? How about Curry? What do you guys think? D. Did you say D? No, D. D. Boy. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. So there are a few risk factors, and we'll go over those before I show you the answer. Um, obesity is one. That's a kind of a big one. Um, both my father and my brother have sleep apnea, so they have to use sleep apnea machine. They are both obese. Um, they both have large neck circumference. And with sleep apnea, they have uh, narrow airways. And they, well, at the time, their diagnosis were not advanced age. So the answer is D. Yep. Yeah, because uh, somebody, even if they're uh, a little bit obese, but they don't have like a large neck circumference, and their airway is really patent at night. You know, they can go through their whole life without having sleep apnea. Does that mean like a bodybuilder who just works out and has a large neck circumference somehow um, narrows their airway? Is that that's a risk factor? Well, that one I'm not exactly sure, but I mean, kind of makes sense because it's a thicker neck and more pressure. Possibly. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So the why would be helpful. The why. Let's see if I have why. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't really say. But yeah, so look it up. <laughs> Alrighty. So you're going to report back to us? <laughs> right. I think that's it. So we'll wait for her to look that up and. <laughs> She's looking up neck circumference, not bodybuilder. So one of the questions on the Kaplan uh, simulation that we did was multiple clients from a plane crash are trans transferred to a hospital. The nurse triages clients to the emergency department. Using the principle of mass casualty, which client does the nurse see first? So the choices were an older adult client with a fractured pelvis, bilateral femur fractures, client is not breathing and unresponsive, the young adult client with burns to the chest, face area, and the client is responsive to stimuli. So why is it the child and not the older adult that's not breathing? 
Is he already dead? Who's most likely to live? Yeah. Well, I guess it didn't really say how long they were not breathing. Not breathing and unresponsive. Well, I would say the other one's responsive. Yeah. Adult client with birds to the chest and face area. Client is responsive to stimuli. Yeah, it's the way that the client is I would say that because they are responsive, so they're still alive, and burns are more susceptible to fluid loss and infection. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but it's uh, people can live with that pretty well. Did you find anything? Yeah, so it just says in most people, a neck size greater than six or seventeen inches. Is a sign of excess fat in the neck area. <clears throat> so it just crowds your um, airway. But then it also says, um, therefore, a large neck likely corresponds to the increased fat tissue elsewhere in the body, including the base of the tongue and the lining of your airway. Did you hear that, Karine? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So, uh, Kelly, on our calendar, it doesn't show anything for 111 on Monday. That's just going to be a lecture day. Um, that's going to be a patho test. Okay. Yeah, so we you won't have anything until Monday after next. Okay, got it. So we'll cover uh, week five, the GIGU alterations in next week and then we'll have a test on this one and next week for that the following monday gotcha okay so just to clarify if you don't have patho you don't have to come to class yes. no. okay no <laughs> so you'll just have one test on monday and that's it oh you don't so the other people that don't have patho i guess have monday off We'll see you again on Friday. Next Friday. Okay. Yeah, you'll see me every Friday. <laughs> and then probably next year for chronic too. Sunny? What? Right. If there's no other questions, you're dismissed. That's right. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.